Great, so why don't we go ahead and get started. So welcome to the April NPR seminar. And today I'm delighted to introduce John Sanchak, who's a, a postdoc at Princeton University after completing his PhD at Penn. And he's gonna talk with us about his work on Lucid, a language for control in the data plane. Awesome, well, thank you for the introduction. And um, thanks everyone for um, joining this webinar today. So um, this is uh, work that I've been doing with my colleagues, Devin Moore, Jennifer Rexford, and David Walker. So usually um, when we think of a data plane application that runs on specialized hardware, like a P4 ASIC, we think of a program that basically has one thread and processes packets using um, remotely managed state. So for example, we might imagine a firewall in P4 that parses each packet extracts its key, and then based on that key, looks up some policy in a table to decide whether to drop or forward the packet. And that policy uh, is typically remotely managed. So when the firewall wants to update state, say because there's a packet from a new flow that arrives and it belongs to a trusted host, the program will signal a remote control process that then updates the policy table. And so the problem with this model is uh, the limitation is performance. This control loop is slow because there's a lot of unavoidable communication overhead. So even if you write an update process that's really fast, the data plane is still going to wait a long time in between um, when it requests the policy update and when that actually happens. And so recently data plane programs are um, increasingly integrating elements of network control right into the data plane itself. So they're using features like register arrays, stateful ALUs, and packet recirculation to implement new data structures that can be updated locally from inside of the ASIC so that there doesn't have to be this remote server or remote switch management CPU in the control loop. And the big benefit here is basically orders of magnitude better performance. This is in terms of both update latency so how long it takes to update state and also throughput. So how many times you can change your policy in a second. And so we've seen in the last few years, a lot of data plane applications that are integrating elements of network control to improve performance for a really diverse range of applications. And a lot of these applications actually compiled to real hardware. So this idea of kind of migrating control into the data plane is not just a theoretical idea, it's something that we can actually do today and potentially use in real networks. But there's a problem. And the problem is that these types of applications that have integrated control in the data plane are really hard to develop in today's languages. So to understand why, let's take a look at some of the challenges of implementing a data plane application in P4 um, that targets the Tofino and has uh, integrated control. The first general challenge is that P4 is missing a lot of abstractions that are important for control applications. So first, very, very simple. Um, if you think about control logic, there are usually multiple operations, multiple functions that have to happen. So maybe in a stable firewall, you have both an add operation and a delete operation. Just doing this, just supporting multiple operations that work on the same state in P4 is already tedious because you have to combine these operations into a single packet processing function. Now, sometimes um, complicating things, some of these operations are actually threads that kind of execute over multiple packets. So for example, maybe your remove operation is actually a check timeout operation, a thread that kind of periodically runs in the background to delete unused entries in your table. To implement threads, you have to make changes that are scattered throughout your P4 program. So for example, to implement a thread that scans for timeouts, one thing you can do is you can use packet recirculation. But to do that, you have to add new headers and parsers for the recirculated packets, and then carefully interleave the processing of those packets with that of the normal data plane packets. So it's a lot of work. 
Third, once you have multiple threads in your control program, you're probably going to want to schedule them in some way. So for example, you probably won't want a scanning thread to run as fast as it can and just recirculate packets constantly. You probably would want it to pause in between scans so that you're not using bandwidth unnecessarily. Somewhat surprisingly, you can actually implement something like this in the Tofino. But to do it, you have to use machinery of the switch that's not even programmable in P4. You have to program the switch's queues via a stream of pause frame packets. And so these packets, you basically send them into the switch and they act as instructions for the switch's um, media access control block, which is outside the scope of P4. Finally, um, a lot of times control is a distributed computation. It's something that happens across the network at multiple nodes. So maybe if instead of a firewall that happens at one node, we have a firewall that is distributed across multiple gateways in a uh, network. Well, one thing we may want is to have one firewall be the reader to coordinate decisions of when to remove entries from um, the tables so that it's synchronized and consistent across all of them. And so to do that kind of application layer messaging, um, like scheduling, it involves more changes throughout the P4 and also outside of P4. And so because these abstractions are missing, writing any control logic in P4 is really tedious, even though the hardware is capable. The second reason why it's hard to write data plane programs with integrated control is because these programs are stateful. And when you work with state in a line rate program, there are certain very fundamental constraints that your code has to respect, or else it will be impossible to compile that code down to the underlying hardware. And the thing is that these constraints are implicit in P4. The language is kind of designed to assume that you know what the constraints are and that you always write code that respects them. The problem is that when you don't obey these constraints, when you introduce a bug that violates them, it's often hard for the compiler to figure out what you've done wrong. And that in turn makes debugging very, very hard. So for example, on the left here, we have pseudocode. Um, of a ingress function that you could not possibly compile to the Tofino because it uses these two persistent objects, these two persistent arrays um, in, in conflicting orders in these two branches of the program. Here's the error that we get. The important thing about the error is that there's no information about why your code fails. Um, what constraint you violated or what line of code uh, caused the problem. And what's happening is that the program is valid according to the P4 front end, which is the part of the compiler that is really designed to give you good feedback because it's analyzing code at the source layer of abstraction. Compilation doesn't fail until the back end. Um, in a very late stage, when the compiler, a Tofino specific part of the compiler, is trying to find a layout of a very low level representation of the program that fits in, in a model of the physical pipeline. And if something goes wrong at that stage, it's very hard to map the failure back to something in the source program. Here's another example, this time of a single um, atomic stateful function that's too complicated to compile to a stateful ALU in the, in the Tofino. Here, this function is valid according to the P4 front end, valid according to the Tofino back end, but an error occurs all the way in the kind of assembly stage of compilation. And this error message is better. It just kind of points the programmer at a line of assembly code, but it still leaves them to work all the way back from that and figure out what a legal assembly instruction looks like for the Tofino and why the compiler generated this instruction for their program. And so in, in our experience, uh, those are kind of the two classes of problems that make it really hard to develop data plane applications with integrated control in P4, missing abstractions and implicit constraints. And so Lucid is a language that we're designing as a solution. 
It's a high level language for writing data plane programs with integrated control that compile to the Tofino. And there's really three interesting parts of Lucid. The first part are the abstractions that Lucid introduces. So these abstractions make it a lot easier to express control in the data plane. And basically Lucid introduces this event-based programming model and a few very simple primitives that end up making it a lot easier to express concurrent threads, scheduled operation, distributed computation, and more. So the philosophy is we're trying to introduce simple general primitives that you can use as building blocks for a lot of different stuff. The second contribution, oh, Sorry, so right, um, we found so far in using Lucid to write programs that basically this lets us write about one-tenth um, the amount of code that we would in P4. The second thing that Lucid introduces is restrictions on the stateful, stateful operations that you can do in the language. Um, and these restrictions are explicitly checked early in the compilation based on the syntax of the language itself. So before we even transform Lucid code into some intermediate representation, we know because of these syntactic checks that we do that the program can compile to a valid sequence of instructions through the underlying hardware. And so then all the backend has to worry about is trying to find a layout or an optimal layout for those instructions in the underlying pipeline. And this design basically lets Lucid give users better feedback and it also reduces the um, kind of amount of edge cases that the compiler backend has to worry about. So if we go back to one of the examples uh, from before, if we wrote this in Lucid, what would happen is it would fail at this syntactic analysis phase and Lucid would give, would give us an error message that tells us exactly what went wrong and which line of code caused the problem. The third part of interesting of Lucid that's interesting is its optimizing compiler. And so the main point here is this, this is a translation layer that converts Lucid into P4 that's optimized for the Tofino. And the main point is it's showing that it's possible to actually use these high level abstractions to write real applications for real hardware. Um, it balances um, kind of the efficiency of the code that it generates, but it also uses kind of classic compilation algorithms that are scalable. So I'm going to talk about these three components of Lucid, the abstractions, the syntactic analysis, and the compiler in more detail. But before I do, um, I just want to pause and, and mention that this kind of concept of compiling high-level code to reconfigurable pipelines is a really huge problem and Lucid doesn't solve all of that problem. So for example, um, there's some recent complementary work that's also checking out, worth checking out, specifically Lyra and Chipmunk, which introduce techniques that let high level data plane languages be more portable, scale across multiple pipelines and compile more efficiently. If you're already familiar with these languages, you can think of Lucid as building on them by first introducing these abstractions that enable control logic in the data plane and second, introducing this more powerful type system and syntactic analysis that catches a much wider class of uncompilable programs to make development easier. And that's kind of for both the developer of the program and the developer of the compiler backend. So next, let's look at the three components of Lucid in a little bit more detail, starting with, an, with its abstractions. And so here we're going to start by looking at Lucid's general programming model, uh, kind of graphically, using the stateful firewall as an example. So first of all, Lucid's event-driven. And so in Lucid, we think of a switch as something that generates and handles events. So events can represent either packets that need to be processed or control operations that need to be performed. In the stateful firewall, one of the events is a packet in event, which represents a packet coming in from the network. And so that packet in event carries with it the source and destination address of the packet as event parameters. 
when an event occurs, the Lucid program executes a handler for that event type. And so a handler is basically a function. So in the stable firewall, the packet in handler is a function that looks up the source and destination address of the packet in an authorized flows data structure to see if that packet should be permitted. The main difference between a handler and a function is that a handler doesn't return. Um, instead, it transfers control flow by generating more events, which might be executed either now or later. So one event the stateful firewall generates is a packet out event. This transfers control flow from the Lucid program to kind of an underlying P4 program. And it has one parameter, which just indicates whether or not the packet should be dropped. Another event that the packet in handler generates is an add flow event. This happens when the first packet of a new flow from a trusted host arrives. So the stateful firewall needs to remember that it's seen that flow so that it can authorize subsequent packets. And we can think of this add flow event as an instruction that the switch sends to itself to remember a new flow from a trusted host. And so this event will get processed by its handler in a separate pass through the switch's pipeline. The add flow operation is interesting because it's actually a recursive process. So in the stateful firewall that we implemented, um, the authorized flow data structure is a cuckoo hash table. So the lookups are in constant time, but the insertions adding a flow happens in expected constant time. And basically what happens is when you insert one item, like say A, into the cuckoo hash table, you might end up displacing a victim that you then need to reinsert. And so you'll kind of continue with this chain of insertions until you either find a spot for the last thing you're trying to insert, or you detect a cycle, which indicates that the table is full. In Lucid, uh, we can represent this type of recursive logic very naturally by just making a handler that generates an event of its own type. So the add flow handler will recurse by generating add flow events until the insertion completes or it finds that the table is full. And so recursion is one thing that's kind of natural to express in this model. Another thing that's natural to express in Lucid is multi-threading. So in the firewall that we've just seen so far, there are already two threads whose execution is interleaved. So there's this packet in thread that runs on this infinite stream of events. And then there's this add flow thread that injects a bounded number of add flow events into that stream whenever we need to install a new entry into the data structure. And so the subtraction of threads just kind of naturally falls out of Lucid's event-driven programming model. There's also a third thread in the staple firewall, which just scans the authorized flows data structure and um, deletes flows that haven't been active in longer than some threshold amount of time. There's one final part of Lucid's programming model uh, to note, which is event combinators. So event combinators basically give us an easy way to change when and where an event gets handled. So for example, when we're scanning timeouts, there's not much benefit to scanning through the authorized flow table as fast as we possibly can. So we can use an event delay combinator, which transforms an event that executes as soon as possible. So for example, the scan event, into an event that executes at some future point in time. So for example, a scan event that executes 10 microseconds from now. The other kind of event combinator is the locate combinator. This transforms an event that executes here into an event that executes at some other switch in the network. So that's the programming model of Lucid and an overview of how we implement a stateful firewall in that programming model. Next, let's look at some actual Lucid code by zooming in on a simple part of the stateful firewall, the um, garbage collection or timeout scanning thread. So here's compilable Lucid code that implements a working but basic timeout thread. So 
right off the bat, we can see that Lucid syntax is simple and imperative. It looks a lot like C. And compared to P4, there's a lot more modularity here, right? We have the kind of main operations of uh, the program broken up into separate handlers. And so in the scan handler, we're basically just checking whether the entry at a certain position is timed out. So the first thing we do is we read the key and the timestamps stored at the position that we're scanning in the data structure. And then we make a decision based on whether the slot is in use and how long it's been since we've seen a packet from the flow in that slot. If the slot is in use but is timed out, we generate a delete event for that slot. Otherwise, we call this user written function to generate an event that scans the next slot in the array. And so going up to this function, it's basically just implementing wraparound logic. So if you've scanned the last position in the array, go back to the start. The interesting thing here is we see this use of a delay combinator, which takes this scan zero event and transforms it into a scan zero event that uh, whose execution is delayed by T weight units of time. Down here in the delete handler, it's just setting the slot to null in both arrays, and then it calls the same do next scan function. And so that function gets inlined into both of these handlers by the compiler. So those are the core abstractions of Lucid. And uh, I think they're quite simple. The philosophy is we're providing a small number of carefully designed general primitives that make it easy to express a wide variety of tasks and also give you the flexibility to kind of build your own custom abstractions. So uh, there was an example of like inline functions in the uh, snippet that I showed. One thing that we've also added to Lucid recently um, is the capability to make modules. So you can take kind of primitive data structures like the arrays that were in that example and can combine them together into your own modules to implement, for example, a cuckoo hash table um, or a bloom filter or whatever you want. Next, let's talk a little bit about the Lucid syntax and type checking, which is designed to catch invalid stateful applications early in the compilation process to make development easier. So, first, the first um, restriction that Lucid checks is related to how multiple persistent arrays are used in a program. And this gets enforced in Lucid's type system. And I'm just gonna give kind of an overview of what this component does, but really there are a lot of interesting details here, I think. And if you'd like to find out more, uh, I'd encourage you to reach out to my collaborator, Devin, who implemented the type system and can explain it um, much better than I would be able to. So. Basically, in the type system, um, it forces the programmer to always use global variables in the same order in every control flow through their program. So when you declare multiple variables, Lucid's type system treats the order of their declarations as a specification of the order in which the arrays will be accessed in the program. So here, for example, the type checker will parse uh, the order of the declarations of the keys and timestamps array, uh, treat it as a specification. And then as it's type checking the program, it will, it will consider the specification and make sure that in every control flow, the arrays are used in the correct order. So it will type check scan, delete. But if for example, we use uh, keys and timestamps in the opposite order in the delete handler, the type checker would detect the error specifically when we did this operation to the keys array. Now, um, this, this type system becomes very useful when um, your programs get more complicated. So for example, it reasons about arrays passed as arguments. So you can write a function that takes a global array as a parameter use it all over in your program and Lucid's type checker will still enforce and tell you whether you satisfied the constraint that you use everything in the proper order. 
which is a fundamental constraint of the hardware that you can't work around. So that's, uh, that's the main constraint that the type system enforces on kind of the order of, of multiple global arrays. The other syntactic constraint in Lucid is on the complexity of stateful operations that you can perform on a single array in a single pass through the pipeline. So in the example we just saw, the handlers only accessed each array once per control path. And they just did simple get and set operations. But what if we wanted to do something a little bit more complex? Like say we wanted to read a value from memory, do some arbitrary computation, and then write that value back to memory. Well, that would fail. It wouldn't type check. And it shouldn't type check because the only way to support a program that reads a value from memory, does arbitrarily complex computation, and then write it, and then write it back to memory um, in the Tofino is to do the write in a recirculated packet. In lucid terms, that would mean generating an event to do this set operation here. But what if we wanted to do something simpler? For example, what if we just wanted to increment the value um, that was stored in the array by one and then write it back to the array? If we're implementing our program at a low level, like in P4, we wouldn't need to do a recirculation because this operation is simple enough to compile to an instruction for a stateful ALU in the underlying hardware. In Lucid, we have a special kind of syntactically restricted function that allows just this sort of optimization. And that function is called a memop. And so a memop is basically just a function that is simple enough for a syntax checker to look at and guarantee that it can be compiled to a legal instruction for a stateful ALU in the underlying hardware. And so we use these memops by passing them to special array methods. So in this example, we're using array.setm. And what that does is that just fetches the value from memory from my array at index i, applies the memop to it, and then writes back the output value of that memop to the same position in memory. So this call to array.setm will do exactly this operation in, in, the, in the upper box. Um, so since there's one operation, the type checker uh, is satisfied and this is compilable, uh, compilable code. Now, Lucid basically forces you to express the stateful logic in this way, but in return, it gives you the guarantee that your stateful logic is not too complicated for the underlying hardware. And so specifically, there are three constraints on memops, and they're fairly simple. So the first constraint is a memop must always have exactly two arguments. The first argument is a value from a cell in memory. The second value is something passed in uh, from the caller of the memop. The second constraint is on the form of the memop. It can either have a single return statement or a if else statement where every branch uh, just has, where both branches just have um, a return statement in them. And the third constraint is on expressions. Every expression in a memop can use uh, each, each argument once and then an unlimited number of constants, which are um, folded together at compile time. So if your memop obeys these three simple restrictions, the Lucid compiler's syntax check can guarantee that the memop can compile to a legal stateful alien instruction. Slightly more precisely, what the syntax check can guarantee is that the array method that calls the memop, that uses the memop, can compile to a legal stateful ALU instruction. And so these are the two main constraints that Lucid explicitly checks. And again, the idea is to restrict the syntax of the stateful parts of a program in easy to understand ways so that programmers can ensure that they're writing code that will ultimately compile to a legal sequence of instructions for the underlying hardware. And second, if the programmers don't do that, the compiler has a mechanism that lets, lets it tell the programmers exactly what went wrong and how to fix their program. 
And so that brings us to the last part of Lucid, the compiler that translates the Lucid code into Tofino optimized P4. And um, the compiler itself is fairly complicated, um, but the structure is, um, is kind of traditional. It looks a lot like you know most other compilers. Rather than go into detail about the individual parts, I just want to give you a high level overview of how we translate the handler functions uh, into P4 and optimize them for the Tofino. So the first thing that the Lucid compiler does to a handler is break down all the expressions in the body of a handler so that every statement is simple enough to map to an ins a single instruction for the Tofino. So for example, here, um, we pre-compute the argument expression and replace it with an intermediate value so that every statement corresponds to basically one instruction in the Tofino. Once that's done, which is actually a fairly involved process, we transform the um, we transform the body of the handler um, into a graph of tables. And for the purpose of this talk, you can think of these tables as just being P4 tables. So it's a little bit more detailed than that in the compiler. And so again, every statement translates into one table. So it's just a kind of macro operation. And, um, and each table can be implemented, um, compiled in the Tofino. And so at this point, what you could do is just directly print P4 code from this table graph. But the problem with that is you use a lot of resources. Specifically, you use a lot of pipeline stages in the hardware um, because of all of the sequential uh, logic here. And you also use a lot of tables because every statement translates to one table. And that causes, uh, that causes problems, that prevents us from fitting a lot of things into, into the hardware. So the compiler does three relatively straightforward optimizations. The first thing it does is it transforms the table graph into straight line code. So a sequence of tables. Each table tests the conditions um, that it depends on for execution. So for example, this table temp one assign only executes if source and dest are both one. Um, instead of relying on the if tables that come earlier in the program to, to check those conditions, temp one assign can just check the conditions itself. So we apply the same transformation to all of the uh, tables in the program, and then um, we can delete the if nodes order the tables topologically and get something that's semantically the same. This brings us down to six tables in six stages. Once we're in this form, um, we know that we can reorder the tables as long as the data flow dependencies between them are preserved. So for example, C array set reads something that's written by temp to assign. So, um, no matter how we lay out these tables, C array set 13 has to execute in a stage after temp to assign. But temp to assign doesn't read anything that is modified by any of the previous tables here. So that can actually go anywhere. This type of table reordering um, can theoretically reduce this number of stages down to two. But the problem is that um, if we're concerned about how many tables are in the program, which is a constraint for more complicated um, applications, um, we're still basically, we still basically have one table for every statement. So the last optimization pass um, reduces the number of tables by merging together tables that can be applied in parallel. And so this is a simple greedy algorithm. The compiler has a sequence of stages, a model of a sequence of stages, and each stage has a fixed number of tables. And the compiler tracks the number of resources that each table in this model has. And so it 
then just takes each node in the data flow graph and the topological ordering and finds the first merged table that it can fit in, making sure to always place a node um, in a later stage than its predecessors. So in this example, the compiler would put all four of these single operation tables into the same merged table here. And then it would put each of these um, array set tables into, um, into a different merged table in stage two. And the reason why they would go into different tables is because the compiler knows that the underlying hardware um, can only access one register array uh, in an individual table. So these are accessing different register arrays, so they couldn't possibly go in the same table. And so that final optimization brings us down to two stages and three tables. And um, that's uh, you know about 70, 75% uh, benefit in this, um, in this example. And empirically, we found on the real applications we've implemented, the optimizations actually were quite helpful. They reduced the number of stages typically by a factor of two. And maybe more importantly, um, we found that most of our programs did not compile um, unless we did these optimizations. So that's a quick look at the Lucid compiler, um, which uses these relatively straightforward scalable algorithms to translate the high level Lucid code into Tofino optimized P4. The last thing um, that I want to mention while I put up this wall of text for you to kind of get lost in is that uh, Lucid is a language that we're building to actually use. So these are some of the applications that we've implemented so far. Um, I'm using Lucid to write Tofino programs for other projects. A few other people in our research group are using the current prototype of Lucid as well. And one of the things that Devin and I are working on right now is refactoring the Lucid prototype, uh, cleaning things up with the intention of making it publicly available in the next month or two. And so Lucid is kind of making my Tofino development a lot easier. And so if you're a Tofino programmer too, I hope that um, you get a chance to check it out. Maybe it will save your time as well. So that's pretty much all that I have uh, to talk about today. Um, in summary, the main points of this talk are that integrated control is this powerful idea. It can really improve the performance of uh, latency sensitive uh, control operations by a lot. The hardware that we have today is capable. What's missing are abstractions and um, implicit constraints in the languages that we have available today, which makes development very hard. Lucid is a solution to these problems. The abstractions that it introduced let us write about one tenth the amount of code compared to P4. The syntactic restrictions that it introduces reduce bugs and helps us improve compiler feedback. And the P4 optimizations um, that we've done let us use Lucid on real hardware and scale to real full applications. So that's all that I have. Um, thank you for your time, and I'm glad to answer any questions. Thanks, John. Uh, do we have uh, questions from folks in the audience? Uh, yeah, I have a question, if that's OK. Go for it. Uh, so, uh, John, thanks a lot. That was a very nice talk, uh, very informative. Um, I was wondering about, uh, you said that you can, uh, you have an event-driven system and you can generate events. And I'm wondering that if you have events besides just uh, normal events that would happen in a router, like uh, incoming packets that can trigger uh, a handler, uh, you also seem to be able to generate events of your own. And that seems to require some runtime support, uh, like uh, event queuing and some kind of event queuing and dispatch mechanism. And I'm wondering how you handle that. You see, you mentioned how to handle memops to keep things simple, but uh, this mm -hmm. event handling seems to require some fairly sophisticated runtime support. And where, where does that run on the, how do you, how do you deal with that? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so, so basically the events that you generate, the, the user events are, um, are mapped to packets that get recirculated. So the main runtime component that we're using is we're using the recirculation capability of the switch. Okay, so you really uh, so only have uh, events that are driven by packet ingress. Is that yeah. the idea? Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So an event, uh, an, an event maps to a packet. I see. Okay, very good. So, um, so um, that's kind of the generation of the event. Um, there's how, other how do you do the de, how do you do the delay? You mentioned a delay event. How do you do how do you do that? Yeah, so um, I think I have a slide that might help, but I'm not sure. Oh, or I might just exit my presentation by accident. <laughs> um, so the delay. Um, basically, what we do is we put that event packet that we generate into a special queue that we set up. And um, this queue, um, what we do is we, we basically pause this queue by using the switches packet generator to inject pause frame packets into itself. And those pause frame packets um, cause the queue to stop emitting packets. And so, we space the pause frame packets basically so that um, so that when you generate a delayed event, um, it sits in this queue for a while and then recirculates. And if the time is not right for its execution, it goes back to the queue and sits there for a little bit more time. So we're tracking, I guess there's two things going on here. First, in each event packet, we're tracking um, when it should be executed. And then we're decrementing that every time it does a recirculation through. And then we're using this special queue to reduce the number of recirculations that we have to do to just a few. Gotcha, cool, thanks. Uh, John, can I ask a question? Um, sure. I'm, uh, I'm Anand from uh, Alibaba Group. Um, so yeah, the two questions. The, the first question is, um, uh, so just I want to confirm my understanding. So the, the Lucid to, to P4 compiler is a, is a research contribution of, of this work or, or not? Because my, my understanding is uh, uh, it, it seems, you know, it, it use uh, you know, the typical, you know, uh, the, the comp compiler, you know, process you know, to, to map the, uh, the IR into the, you know, the, the, P4, the P4 code and, you know, generate the, the tables, um, you know, kind of similar to the compiler techniques in my understanding. So I just want to confirm whether, you know, this part is a, is a, is a, is a contribution or maybe I missed something. So I think the main contributions of Lucid are the, um, are the abstractions that it introduces yeah. and the syntactic checking, right? Um, mm. I think the the compiler. Um, I, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, I think there's probably overlap with with other other compilers. One thing that I thought was interesting is we see a lot of a lot of um, work on like um, really compute intensive approaches to compilation um, for uh, for you know, converting things into to Pinot P4. Um, the interesting thing here is that it doesn't require those compute intensive approach. All of these algorithms are, are fairly straightforward. So I think it's not as intellectually interesting, um, but uh, it, is, it is useful. And the other thing is that uh, shortly this will be an open source tool that um, you know everyone can use. Yeah, yeah, I, I, I totally understand. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I, I, I totally agree. The, the abstraction part and uh, uh, the, the type checking part is, is very interesting. I, I totally agree. Yeah, I, I mean, I just want to confirm my, my understanding. Oh, yeah, so, so the, yeah. the second, the, yeah, yeah, sorry, go ahead. No, no, I, I, that's a, a great point to clarify and uh, <laughs> I agree. <laughs> so, so the so the, the second question is also about the, the compiling because in, in my opinion, you know, my my experience, uh, it's you know to to build a, a real compiler, uh, 
uh, especially if we want to make the generated P4 code compilable to you know the, the real hardware. I think that uh, the, the the difficult part is um, how how can we understand or how can we successfully to extract a, a complement a complement uh, set of the the hardware constraint because sometimes we need some you know hardware constraint when when we try to generate the you know the, the real P4 code and yeah and you know. The, the, the Tofino compiler is, is a hard is a, a black box to, to Earth, and we, we have read a very long, say, uh, two hundred page uh, specification of their mm -hmm. their hardware constraint. <laughs> you know, from from the from the barefoot, that's very very tough thing. So my, my question is, uh, so so if we want to generate the compilable, you know, P4 code, so how 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 did you uh, deal with you know the the hardware constraint to make sure the generated code can you know can be successfully uh, come compiled you know, directly uh, into the hardware. Yeah. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. And um, I don't think, you know, we have a, a completely satisfying answer to that. Um, the, the basic approach that we took is we have an intermediate representation that represents our translation of that kind of, you know, 200 line, 200 uh, page architectural specification an intermediate representation that represents what the Tofino can do. Um, and, um, and we translate it into that specification um, and then we put it in, you know, generate P4 code from that. And when things don't work, sometimes it's because a constraint was wrong. Sometimes it because, it's because there's a compiler bug. And so we would adjust or work around it. So, um, you know, it's not, Satisfying, but I, I don't know. Like because it's also closed source and all, I, I don't really know. You know. Uh, yeah, make, make what sense. other options there are. Yeah, yeah. makes sense to me. I mean, so it, it's hard. I mean, but but it may not be a research problem. I think. But yeah, thanks. yeah. I don't know. I think I think there's things related to like intermediate representations um, that probably is a research problem. But uh, you know, like I said, this is a huge space, and there's just so much work to do. <laughs> yeah, uh, thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for the questions. Marty? Yeah, so thanks for the talk. I really enjoyed it, John. I had a question about the part where you uh, talked about the syntactic restrictions on the memop uh, so that mm -hmm. it fits onto a stateful ALU. I was wondering, can you say anything about sort of the completeness of it? Does it capture every possible operation that can be fit or most of it, or you know, what's the kind of uh, guarantee that you can give mm -hmm. with those restrictions? Yeah, that's a great point. And I'm really glad you asked that question because it's something that I meant to, um, meant to mention, but forgot. Um, so it does not capture uh, everything that you could implement in a stateful ALU. Um, and there's this tension that we had when designing it Whereas on the one hand, we wanted to keep the, the kind of syntactic restrictions uh, simple and easy to understand, right? But on the other hand, you wanna give the programmers the ability to do lots of different non-trivial things. Right. Um, and so kind of where we ended up with here is a design that's just balancing those two things. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in all the applications we've implemented so far, which is, I guess, a little over a dozen, we found that this was enough. Um, I think that I can at least imagine a, an application where, you know, this is not enough, and we need more more powerful uh, representations of state loyal views. Um, you know, kind of kind of along the lines of the, um, you know, the work with uh, maybe Banzai, or, and the the transactions, uh, the transaction work. Um, I think um, so. I think there's still I think there's still more work to do there on, you know, what are other forms of memory operations that strike the right balance between understandable to the user and also, you know, maybe covers different parts of the of the space of what you can do with a stateful ALU. And then right. the other thing is that like in the Tofino two. Um, the memory operations, I think, are, are more flexible. So there's different things that you might be able to do there. So, so I think that's a... So just as yeah, a follow-up to that, uh, suppose 
you found something in a program that doesn't meet your syntactic restrictions, do you actually provide ways to do any semantic transformations so that it might fit? Are you currently uh, yeah. using any? Not right now. Uh, we don't apply any, any semantic okay. transformations to the okay to the state FOIAs. Yeah, that's that's also um, a great idea. It's something that okay, thanks. Be good to do. Yeah, thank you. I love it. So yeah, maybe just uh, adding to this question a little bit. So once you add uh, so combine uh, control and data, particularly with this sort of packet recycling. Um, mm -hmm. I, I was wondering too, how close are you to actually having a Turing complete language or an, uh, ask differently, is there a potential for sort of packet explosion um, and sort of denial of service attacks and things like that? That's my first question. And the second question are, is about the relation to something like P4All um, and um, also to um, um, algorithms for doing parallelization for VLIW architectures or other um, parallelizing compilers. Um, so some of the yeah. dependence analysis and, and sort of um, uh, squashing things into just two stages and so um, seem, seem uh, mm -hmm. actually similar mm -hmm. to that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Okay, great questions. So um, first, uh, right, recirculation is extremely powerful and uh, right now you have to be very careful when you're using it so you do have to think about that in the design of your algorithm so if you have a program that you write and you know every time you get a packet in you generate an event and then that event just generates two more events then yes you have this this explosion you know whatever you're going to break your switch immediately uh denial of service yourself um so we don't we don't address that in this work uh, besides noting that you know it's this makes it easier to like the abstractions here in the programming model makes it at least easier to see whether your algorithm is kind of sensible um, or not right compared to just writing a huge blob of, of p4 code and like what's going on it's hard to tell i think that um in the future, one of the things that uh, we're, we're thinking about is doing static analysis to the code to basically tell you you're using recirculation in an unsafe way. Look, here's this handler and it's generating you know, two events and also it's getting called every time you get a packet from the data plane, so that's unsafe. Um, I think we can do those types of static analysis to better inform um, the programmers uh, to kind of stop themselves from from you know shooting themselves in the foot. Um, so that's one. I'm sorry, I forgot the the. Oh yeah, the questions were about P for all and VLIW. Right, right. P for all. Okay, so P for all, um, I think complements this in in two ways. So first, in P for all, you have um, this idea of um, kind of more powerful uh, like compile time abstractions for things like for loops that are automatically unwound. That would be a great feature uh, to you know, kind of add in a, a merged language. The other thing is um, in P4All, a lot of what you're reasoning about or what they're reasoning about, I think is uh, the kind of sizes of data structures. So, you know, you want some register array data structure and it's just so big it doesn't fit in one stage. Uh, we don't really, we don't address those types of concerns about sizes of things. Um, and that's that's something that P4All does reason about. So I think, you know, that's very complimentary. Um, about compilation techniques for VLIWs. So honestly, that is an area that I have been meaning to do research in for uh, a while. Uh, so I think that there is overlap and there are probably techniques there that would be, uh, that would be useful to apply here. Um, so, you know, like if you have any specific suggestions on where to start. Um, no, I'm not much of an expert myself either. It's just sort of, uh, 
rings a bell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah you're, you're absolutely right. Yeah. Thanks. Great talk. Great. Any other questions or comments? Yeah, I have one, John. I mean, if you imagine other targets, I know a lot of what you did here is, was uh, specific to the Tofino or at least to the PISA-like models. If you had something like an FPGA or a, you know, a different kind of target, do you have thoughts on like, which aspects of Lucid would, or, or its compiler would, would change and what, what, would, what would stay the same? Like, it seems like the MemOps piece in particular seems mm -hmm. more specific to the, the having some structured ALU. Yeah. Yeah, so I think the memops um, are specific to these memops are, are very specific even to probably the Tofino. Um, I think the kind of the, the ordered type system is something that I think would be useful on a wide range of, of platforms. So basically anything where you have you know, reconfigurable hardware, I could imagine it being useful on an FPGA because there, the physical layout of memory on the FPGA matters, uh, even if it's easier to do a you know, equivalent of a recirculation right, to move data backwards. Um, I think on a flexible platform like that, um, we would want some abstraction of memops that maybe gives the user more power to define the form of the memop that they want. And maybe we would want to tell the user something about how the form of the memop that they have specified, um, you know, what is its timing and stuff like that. Um, so I think the ideas are are generally useful, um, but I, I think it is an interesting question as to how to generalize it to to support multiple platforms in an easy to program way. Thanks. Any other comments or questions? All right. Well, why don't we stop there? Thanks so much, John. Really appreciate it. And we'll be announcing our next talk uh, soon for, for the rest of our seminar series. So thanks for joining us and be safe. Thanks, guys.